In this video, we're going to learn about the independent samples t-test and the Cohen's d effect size associated with the independent samples t-test. This is going to be a new hypothesis test that's useful for a different sort of experimental context, a different experimental situation. So we've already learned about two different hypothesis tests. First, the one sample z test, and second, the one sample t test. And there were a lot of similarities between these two formulas and uh, only one or two differences, namely that in the t test, you don't need to know the true population standard deviation, and instead you just approximate that using sample standard deviation. But there's a lot of similarities in terms of actually calculating these test statistics, but also in terms of when they're used. Both the one sample z test and the one sample t test are appropriate for just what the name says, one sample. So this is useful when you have one group and you're testing that one group sample mean against a hypothesized population parameter. But what happens instead when you want to test more than one group? That's what we're going to talk about today. As one last bit of review, I'll remind you that you also learned about the effect sizes for the one sample z test and the one sample t test. And from here on out, we're going to continue with that trend, learning about a hypothesis test and then learning about the effect size associated with that test. So here's our goal for this video and for this new hypothesis test. We want to be able to investigate whether two independent groups, and I'll define independent in a moment, we want to investigate whether two independent groups differ significantly along a dimension of interest. And there's so many situations in which this is going to be useful, in which this is going to be our goal. Uh, and I'll get to that. So first I want to mention that independent here means completely unrelated. Not necessarily in like a familial sense, but just it means two separate groups of people, men versus women. Or if you're talking about an experiment, the experimental condition people versus the control condition people. Or college students versus non-college students. So the key here is these are independent from one another. They're two separate groups of people and there is no overlap. There's no single person that's in both groups. We also call this between subjects designs. So this term here, the between subjects design, refers to the research method that we're talking about here. So whereas the independent samples t-test that we're going to learn about is the test statistic, the between subjects design is the research design, the research method for which the independent samples t-test is appropriate. And here's one example of, you know, an experiment in which the independent samples t-test is going to be appropriate. Here's an example of a between subjects design. So here's my research question. Do exercise classes improve people's moods more than exercising alone? So think about this. I have two different groups. I have people who are exercising in a group, and I have people who are working out alone. So this is a perfect case in which we're going to need an independent samples t-test. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure some form of mood. Maybe I'll look at anxiety, for example, or you know how happy people are, or how depressed they feel. Something that gets at moods and feelings in this way. And I want to know, does the average mood differ between people who work out in a group and people who work out alone, and this is appropriate for an independent samples t-test. So let's state our statistical hypotheses. As we've learned before, this is sort of the first step in designing a study, designing an experiment. So just to remind you, the null hypothesis states that there's basically no effect, or in this case, there's no difference between the two groups, people who work out uh, together in groups and people who work out alone. The alternative hypothesis just states the opposite. There is an effect. There is a difference between these two groups. And here's how we would state this symbolically. The mean of group one is going to be equal to the mean of group two. This is what the null hypothesis states. The mean mood, the average anxiety level, for example, of people who work out in groups will be the same as the average anxiety level of people who work out alone. This is a symbolic way of saying no difference equal to one another, right? The alternative states the opposite, so the mean of group one will not equal the mean of group two, which is to say there will be a difference between these two averages. And more specifically for our experiment, the mean anxiety level, for example, of people who work out in groups will not be equal to the mean anxiety level of people who work out alone. So these are our statistical hypotheses. So here's sort of the situation we're looking at. You have a population that you want to draw from. This is always the first step. Pick your population of interest. From there, you'll collect a random sample of, you know, uh, say 100 people, however many people you want in your study. And then you're going to randomly assign those 100 people to one of two different groups. 
sample one or group one and sample two or group two. So in this case, for example, we could call sample one, the group of people who work out in groups, you know, in a class of size n and one. So this is maybe 50 people. And sample two is the size of the group uh, n2 of people who work out alone. So this might be another 50 people. Now look, our treatments are applied between subjects. So treatment one for sample one will be work out in a group, twice perhaps, right? And uh, treatment two for group two is going to be work out alone, twice. And then we collect some sample statistics. The average of group one will be their average anxiety level, and the variance of group one is going to be the variance of their anxiety. And then for group two, we're gonna get those same sample statistics, their average anxiety, and the variance of their anxiety. And look here, make a note of the sample statistics we're collecting here, sample size, sample mean, and sample variance for two groups. Six different things, this is all you're actually going to need to calculate the independent samples t-test. Here's the formula for the independent samples t-test. So we have t and then this really ugly subscript. This isn't anything computational. You don't actually have to do anything with the subscript, but it's just to help you realize that we're comparing two different sample means. X bar one, the sample mean for group one, minus X bar two, the sample mean for group two. And so subscripts is gonna be really helpful for us, as I've mentioned many times before, because as we add on more and more hypothesis tests, it's gonna be really, really important for us to be able to keep track which formulas are for which test. And we're gonna learn about the Cohen's D effect size for this test as well. And that's gonna just have this same subscript, excuse me, X bar one minus X bar two. So don't get overwhelmed by subscripts. They are your friends. They are here to help you keep track of what formulas go with what tests and which experimental context. So keep track of this. So here we have T and then our subscript equals x bar one minus x bar two. That's where we get this subscript. This numerator defines basically the comparison of interest, the mean of group one minus the mean of group two. And in the denominator, we have standard error. This is not standard deviation. The subscript tells us that this is the standard error associated with this test. Now, unfortunately, the standard error we have here is a little bit less pretty than the standard error we have for the one sample Z test and the one sample T test, which is very similar. Just to remind you, for the one sample T test, for example, the uh, standard error looks something like this, right? And that's it, standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size. I bet you miss those days now because uh, this is much less attractive. But as I said, there's actually only six things you need to complete this entire formula, to find the standard error and then to find the overall t-test statistic. And here are the six things. So you need, again, sample sizes, right? Very easy, you just count how many people are in each group. You need the means, right? pretty easy as well, calculating two sample means. And then you need two sample variances, the variance of scores in group one and the variance of scores in group two. So this requires a little bit more work, the sample variances, but you guys know how to do that by now as well. Once you have that, it's just a matter of plugging in and reducing down. Plug in all of your sample sizes for the two groups, right? Plug in your variances and all that good stuff. So uh, it's really not too bad of a problem once you get the hang of it, especially if you're comfortable calculating sample variance. And finally, here's the Cohen's D effect size associated with the independent samples t-test. So the numerator is the same as we often see, x bar one minus x bar two, the mean of group one minus the mean of group two, no difference in the numerator. The denominator does change. Here you'll see S sub P. P here stands for pooled. It is the pooled standard deviation. Because remember, for hypothesis tests, in the denominator goes standard error. But for effect sizes, standard deviation goes in the denominator. Well, that kind of poses a problem for us because here we have two different standard deviations to worry about, the standard deviation for group one and the standard deviation for group two. So we need to find a way to pool those two standard deviations together to combine them into one sort of composite standard deviation, and here it is. So it's a very simple formula. This is why you need to find the sample variances, right? You need it for this formula as well, the sample variance for group one and the sample variance of group two, and you're basically taking an average of the two. You're adding them up and dividing by two, so then you sort of have an average sample variance between the two groups, and to turn that variance into a standard deviation, sort of, you take the square root, right? And so this is sort of an average standard deviation between 
between the two groups. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but that is the idea we're working with. And this is how you calculate the independent samples t-test and the effect size for an independent samples t-test. And in our next video, we're going to go over an example, some sample data to actually do that.